NASA's capstone mission has successfully launched on Rocket Lab's Electron rocket on June 28 from Launch Complex 1B in New Zealand. As planned, the rocket successfully passed Max-Q, stage separation, and fairing separation during the flight. The CIS Lunar Autonomous Positioning System Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment, or the capstone, is attached to Rocket Lab's Lunar Photon Kick Stage, which will send the 25-kg spacecraft on its way to deep space. The Photon Kick Stage was deployed nine minutes after launch, and it fired its Hypercurie engine twice in an hour to raise its orbit. About six days after launch, and after a series of orbit raising maneuvers and the final translunar injection burn, Photon will release Capstone into a ballistic lunar transfer trajectory to the Moon. As of July 1, the kick stage had fired the Hypercurie engine six times and raised the spacecraft's apogee to 69,680 km. The next and final burn is scheduled to occur as early as July 4, after which the Capstone spacecraft will be deployed. The final photon burn will propel capstone 1.3 million kilometers from Earth, more than three times the distance to the Moon, before the gravity of the Earth-Moon system pulls it back towards the Moon. Following that deep space transfer, the spacecraft will enter a near-rectilinear halo orbit around the Moon on November 13. The primary goal of the capstone mission is to test and validate the calculated orbital stability of a near-rectilinear halo orbit around the Moon, the same orbit planned for NASA's Gateway. Gateway is a small space station that will orbit the Moon and provide astronauts access to the lunar surface. Because of the balancing gravitational pulls of the Moon and Earth, mission engineers expect the near-rectilinear halo orbit to be highly stable, and a spacecraft should not need to burn much fuel to stay there. However, because no spacecraft has ever occupied a lunar near-rectilinear halo orbit, assumptions about its stability are mere speculations. And that's where Capstone comes in. Once in the near-rectilinear halo orbit, the spacecraft will fly within 1,600 km of the Moon's north pole on its near pass and 70,000 km from the south pole at its farthest. It will repeat the cycle every six and a half days and maintain this orbit for at least six months to assess the characteristics of the orbit. Capstone will also test an advanced space navigation system, which will measure its absolute position in cis lunar space by interacting with NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. This peer-to-peer -peer navigation technique will allow future spacecraft to determine their location without relying on tracking data from Earth-based ground antennas. The Capstone mission is a huge milestone for Rocket Lab, which had never before launched a deep space mission. If everything goes as planned, Rocket Lab will launch at least one life-hunting mission to Venus using an Electron rocket in 2023. SpaceX successfully launched a European telecommunications satellite into orbit on June 29. A Falcon 9 rocket lifted off from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station on Wednesday evening, carrying the CES-22 satellite into orbit. The launch was SpaceX's 27th of the year and the 161st Falcon 9 flight overall. About eight and a half minutes after launch, the Falcon 9's first stage came back down to Earth for a pinpoint touchdown on a SpaceX drone ship. The first stage booster used for Wednesday's mission was relatively brand new and was only used for one Starlink mission before. Meanwhile, the rocket's upper stage continued to propel the spacecraft toward a geosynchronous transfer orbit, eventually deploying the satellite there 33 minutes after liftoff. CES-22 is the first of six geostationary satellites ordered by Luxembourg-based satellite and terrestrial network provider, CES, to migrate broadcast customers into a narrower swath of C-band. From its parking spot in geostationary orbit more than 36,000 kilometers above the equator, CES-22 will begin a 15-year mission beaming cable TV and radio programming to millions of American homes. Two more CES-C band satellites, CES-18 and 19, will launch together on a single Falcon 9 rocket around the end of the year. Indian Space Research Organization's PSLV C-53 launch vehicle rocketed into space from the Satish Dhawan Space Center on Thursday evening, carrying three Singaporean satellites into orbit. It was India's second mission this year. PSLV, or the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, is a four-stage 44 meters tall expendable rocket with a maximum liftoff mass of about 320 tons. The mission was the 55th mission of PSLV and the 15th mission using the PSLV core alone variant. The primary payload of the mission was a 365 kg Earth observation satellite called DSEO, which is an electro-optic multispectral payload that will provide full-color images for land classification and serve humanitarian assistance and disaster relief needs. The second satellite on board was the 155 kg New SAR, Singapore's first small commercial satellite capable of providing images at all times of day and night and under all weather conditions. The third payload was a 2.8 kg student satellite called SCUB-1. The rocket injected all three payloads into a 570 km orbit about 18 minutes after liftoff. 
After the satellites were injected into orbit, the rocket's fourth stage turned into an orbital platform, dubbed PSLV Orbital Experimental Module, which will perform in-orbit scientific experiments. The module carries six payloads, and it have its own power supply, telemetry package, data storage, and attitude control for hosted payloads. It is the first time the fourth stage of a PSLV rocket has orbited the Earth as a stable platform. The next PSLV mission will launch in August, carrying three satellites into low Earth orbit. United Launch Alliance and Virgin Orbit launched satellites into orbit for the United States Space Force last week. The first launch took place on July 1. A United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket launched the USS F-12 mission for the U.S. Space Force from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. It was the 94th mission of the Atlas V rocket. The mission carried the wide field of view missile warning spacecraft for the U.S. Space Force and a ring-shaped payload adapter with six small SAT for the Department of Defense. Wide field of view satellite, built by Millennium Space Systems, will be used to test different ways to collect and report missile launch data. The 3,000 kg testbed satellite, which has a lifespan of three to five years, will aid in the development of future missile warning satellites. The mission's secondary payload is a ring-shaped payload adapter, known as the propulsive ESP airing, which carried six classified payloads into orbit. The satellites are designed to carry out research and development for future military applications. About six hours after lifting off from Cape Canaveral, the Centaur upper stage placed the payloads into a 36,000 km geosynchronous orbit. The Virgin Orbit launch for the U.S. Space Force took place seven and a half hours after the Atlas V mission. The Cosmic Girl aircraft, carrying the Launcher 1 rocket, took off from Mojave Air and Spaceport in California for the straight-up mission on July 1. The Boeing 747 flew west toward the Pacific Ocean before turning southeast to align with the azimuth required to achieve a 45-degree inclination orbit. The aircraft then released the Launcher 1 from an altitude of 11 kilometers, and it went into a four-second freefall. As Cosmic Girl banked to the right, Launcher 1 ignited its Newton 3 engine and began to climb to its orbit. Stage separation, second stage ignition, and payload fairing separation went off without a hitch. Just over half an hour after the rocket was released from the Cosmic Girl, all seven satellites on board were deployed into a 500 km orbit. The satellites are designed to carry out space-based communications, in-space navigation, and climate change experiments. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. On June 23, Booster 7, outfitted with 33 second-generation Raptor engines, was transported to the launch pad to begin its engine testing campaign ahead of the orbital flight test. SpaceX had informed the U.S. Coast Guard that Booster 7 testing will take place at their facility between June 27 and 30. Road and beach closure notices were also posted on the Cameron County government website. However, Booster 7 static fire tests were not conducted last week. Instead, SpaceX conducted Booster 7 proof tests from Monday to Thursday. SpaceX spent those four days filling and venting cryogenic liquid nitrogen from Booster 7. Moreover, venting was also observed from the orbital launch mount as the teams prepared Stage 0 for the test campaign. They also activated the tank farm and completed final checks on the Raptor engines installed on Booster 7. In short, last week, SpaceX was busy preparing the launch site and Booster 7 for the upcoming static fire campaign. As per the updated schedule, static fire tests will begin as early as Tuesday, July 5. The overall format of the test campaign is still unknown. According to Elon Musk, Booster 7 will start by igniting just one or two Raptor engines. SpaceX may then proceed to test the inner three engines, the middle 10, and finally the outer 20. If everything goes as planned, we'll then see a static fire test involving all 33 Raptor engines. However, before beginning the static fire test campaign, SpaceX may conduct a full wet dress rehearsal of Booster 7. The test will involve filling the propellant tanks of the booster with subcooled liquid oxygen and liquid methane. The test will precisely replicate a static fire test campaign, but will end just before engine ignition. SpaceX will use the data collected during these extensive test campaigns to prepare the booster for the orbital test flight, which could take place as soon as next month. The readiness of Starship 24 for the orbital launch is also something to keep an eye on. SpaceX has recently completed installing all six Raptor engines of the prototype. Heat-resistant paint has recently been applied to sensitive areas of Ship 24 where plasma may extend during atmospheric re-entry. The vehicle will be rolled out to the launch site to begin static fire testing in the near future. While Ship 24 and Booster 7 will be in the spotlight for the next few weeks, Ship 25 and Booster 8 are being readied at the build site. 
The liquid oxygen tank section of Booster 8 is currently in the Mega Bay, while the methane tank is in the High Bay, where both are being processed. Those two sections are expected to be stacked in the coming days. The common dome of Ship 25 is currently in the Mid Bay, and the oxygen tank section is in the High Bay. Furthermore, teams recently installed the Starlink satellite dispenser into the nose cone barrel section of Ship 25. Once all the sections are fully ready, SpaceX will begin stacking Ship 25. Work on the Starship launch tower and launch pad at Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A is moving quickly. The third section of the Starship launch tower was recently transported and stacked at Pad 39A by SpaceX. Six more sections are needed to complete the 146-meter tall integration tower, and they are being built at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility. Parts of the rocket catching and stacking arm of the launch tower at Pad 39A are arriving at Kennedy Space Center one by one. Before being transported to Pad 39A, they will be partially assembled at the Roberts Road facility. After being fully assembled at Pad 39A, the arms, dubbed Mechazilla chopsticks, will be integrated onto the launch tower. The Booster 7.1 test tank was recently structurally tested on the Can Crusher test stand by Starbase engineers. The test began by filling the test tank with subcooled liquid nitrogen. After the tank was completely filled, 20 cables running from the cap of the can crusher to the hydraulic rams of the test stand began squeezing the test tank. This test was carried out to simulate the forces that will be experienced by a super heavy booster during flight. The test lasted about six hours from start to finish, and it appears that booster 7.1 performed flawlessly throughout. The booster 7.1 test tank was specially designed by SpaceX to test the latest super heavy design changes. Please watch my previous video for more information on those design changes. Link in the description. As many of us know, SpaceX is planning to launch several Starlink Gen 2 satellites into orbit during the upcoming orbital test flight. You may also remember the Starlink integration box I explained in a previous video. The box, which has a short but wide door at its bottom, is designed to load the second-generation Starlink satellites into starships. The box was lifted up to ship 24's payload bay on June 30, and hours later, it was lowered back to the ground. Ship 24's payload bay door was open when the box was lifted, and it was closed after the box was lowered. Maybe SpaceX was performing a fit check, or perhaps they were loading dummy satellites into the payload bay. And I don't think they have loaded functional Starlink Gen 2 satellites into Ship 24, because the ship hasn't yet completed all of its pre-launch tests and isn't yet fully qualified for the orbital flight test. Super Heavy Booster 5, which had been standing on a display stand at the build site for the past several months, was moved to the Mega Bay on June 27. Three days later, the methane tank section was severed from the rest of the booster, marking the beginning of the booster scrapping process. Meanwhile, on June 30, SpaceX moved Super Heavy Booster 4 from the launch site to the build site. The prototype later took the position of Booster 5 in the rocket garden, alongside ships 15, 20, and 22. There are some unconfirmed reports that the two unused vertical methane storage tanks at the tank farm are being converted into water tanks. SpaceX has already installed seven horizontal tanks to store liquid methane instead of those vertical tanks. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.